Let's talk about Liskov's substitution principle. Liskov's substitution principle is the L in the solid principles, in the solid object-oriented design principles. I find Liskov's substitution principle to be sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy where people tell each other that it's the most difficult principle to understand and through that, making it the most difficult principle to understand because nobody actually takes the time to understand the principle. When in fact, the principle is actually really, really simple. <clears throat> so the principle states that if you have a base type and you have a subtype, in other words, if you have a base class and you have a class inheriting from that base class, then the subclass should be substitutable for the base class at any point in the program. In other words, in every place where you're using the, the base type, you should be able to swap that instance for an instance of the subtype without causing any unwanted behavior in the program. And that's it, right? It's not, it's not any more strange than that. It just means that you have, the, you have an inheritance hierarchy and as soon as you're making, as soon as you're inheriting from the base class in a, in a way that makes the subclass not substitutable for this particular base class, then you're breaking the Liskov substitution principle. It's that simple. To really dig into the details, I find it most helpful to think about preconditions, postconditions, and invariants. If you're not familiar with preconditions, postconditions, and invariants, don't worry, I'll make another video on, and I'll link that in the description as soon as it's done. But very simply, preconditions are sort of the entry conditions for the method. To be able to call that particular method, whatever is stated in the preconditions must be true. Postconditions are sort of the other end of that spectrum. Postconditions state whatever must be true when the method has been called. And invariant state what has to be true at all times in the program. So in terms of Liskov substitution principle, here's how this helps us. Preconditions in the subtype must be the same or weaker. I'll get into what this means, hang on. Postconditions in the subtype must be the same or stronger than the base type's postconditions. In variants, I find sort of uh, conflicting information, so we're gonna have to dig deeper into that some other time. But there seems to be two schools of argument here, that either invariance has to be exactly the same in subtypes, in other words, invariance can't change in the subtype, or the other school of thought th seems to be that invariance must be either the same or stronger. Let's first talk about a very concrete example. Let's take the classical animal example. So say that you have an animal, which is a base class, and then you have, say that you have a cat, and then you have something, something non-animal-ish, like a box. I mean, I'm just doing this example very silly so that you will really understand sort of the principle. So let's say that uh, the base class states that the, uh, that the class needs to have, or that the object needs to have a method called walk, right? Which will make the, which will make the instance walk. But for some odd reason, right? We've architecture our application strangely. For some odd reason, we really need the box to inherit from animal. Yes, this is stupid, I know. But because the box doesn't implement the walk method, so in that case, what do we do? Maybe we throw an exception. So we throw an exception in the walk method in the subtype box. And this is the problem. This means that the subtype is not entirely substitutable. Box cannot be used in all places where animals can be used because box may throw an exception that's unwanted. Of course, everything becomes different if we're actually expecting that e exception, if that exception is part of sort of the, the intent of the design. But let's talk about that some other time. So you can think of it this way. Realize that when we're talking about typing, we're talking about subtyping, right? We're talking about something being a subtype of something else. So cats are a subset of all animals, right? Boxes are not a subset of all animals. <clears throat> so to understand the whole preconditions, postconditions, invariance thing uh, in Liskov substitution principle, it helps to think about the robustness principle. So the robustness principle states that you should be liberal in what you accept from others, but conservative in what you send. So in other words, that means a method should be accepting when users of the method are sending it incorrect values, but it should be very careful with itself sending incorrect values. 
I think the history of this is that it's from networking or something like this. It's actually a very good principle and <clears throat> there's this joke that if this would apply to people and not only to programming, the world would be fantastic. Just saying. I'm not at all religious, but it's kind of like the golden rule, right? So the robustness principle essentially says the same thing as the demands in terms of preconditions and postconditions in relation to this substitution principle, right? So the subclass, a method in the subclass, must receive everything that the base class is expecting it to be able to receive, right? The whole set of possible values. But because it's liberal, right? It may also accept a bit more. So it's, it's the set of all the possible values that it uh, may receive given that it's the type of the subclass, of the base class. But it may, it's, it's a larger set, so it may also receive some more. The post conditions of the subclass, however, must be the same or stronger, right? And stronger means that it's a subset, right? So methods in the subclass must either return values from the same set, right? Or from the same domain, values from the same set. In other words, the same types of values that you get from the base class. Or if it doesn't do that, it must return a subset of the set of possible values, right? So in, in other words, you would never receive anything unexpected from the subclass, right? You would never, because you're conservative in what you send. So you would send either anything that the base class sends, or you would send something even more restrictive, right? It's all about being able to depend on the subclass following the contract, right? To have no surprises. And invariance, lastly. Again, invariance in the base class uh, must be followed or must be stronger in the subclass. In other words, thinking about sets again, the, the set of possible states of the subclass must either be the same as the set of the base class or it must be stricter. It must be a subset of the set of states of the base class. I know this gets super confusing with all the sets, but if you really start to think about it, it's not actually that strange. So again, actually, I wouldn't argue that Liskov's substitution principle is difficult to understand. You just really have to think about it. What's difficult about the Liskov substitution principle, I find, is to actually follow it. Because when you really start to understand it, you understand, it that, most, understand that most of the time we're actually doing it wrong, right? We're subclassing too much. Saying that Liskov substitution principle is, is bad because it's difficult to follow is kind of like blaming testing for your system being difficult to test. Testing, a, a system that's difficult to test, is an indicator that your system is poorly architectured, that it's highly coupled. Right? Similarly, violations of the Liskov substitution principle is an indicator that your system may be poorly architectured in terms of inheritance. Right? You may be overusing inheritance in places where inheritance shouldn't actually be used. That's it for today. For more stuff like this, be sure to subscribe.